We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Welcome. Uh, maybe let's give it one more minute for online participants to tune in and for on-site participants to find their way to the meeting room. It is wonderful to have everybody here in this unique, um, but very appropriate uh, to the subject matter hybrid setting, given how pervasive um, online reality made our offline uh, reality in the last couple of months. All right, looks like we have critical mass. Um, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Anna Kampanek. I am the director of um, global programs at the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SITE. Joining you from Washington, DC, where we are based. Uh, however, SITE works in countries around the world with um, private sector reformers and other types of um, civil society organizations and activists on a wide range of issues in the um, democratic and uh, market-oriented sphere. Uh, technology more broadly and uh, internet freedom uh, more specifically has become a major issue in our work, uh, really uh, a powerful undercurrent. Um, and uh, today uh, also, uh, obviously, the importance of internet in our lives has been greatly amplified uh, by the global pandemic. Um, our topic today deals with uh, forging trust in the digital economy and specifically looking at the consumer perspective. We all appreciate how much the internet um, and the ability to conduct e-commerce in particular uh, has simplified our lives. Uh, we all enjoy um, the benefits of wide access to goods from around the world, the convenience of shopping from your own house. At the same time, um, there are a number of issues or risks that uh, e-commerce has created and also the pandemic um, highlighted. Um, for one, I've been recently looking at the OECD uh, Committee on Consumer Policy uh, survey of 13 countries uh, that looked at the financial, personal and financial detriments uh, that um, consumers online experience. Uh, and in fact, almost half of the surveyed consumers experienced some kind of um, problem with um, their online order. Uh, although the majority sought redress, still about 50% afterwards were not happy with the resolution. Um, problems with um, product um, and delivery of it were the leading causes uh, of complaints, uh, not surprisingly. Um, and uh, let's also keep in mind the detriments that go beyond the financials. Uh, many survey respondents also noted issues with um, stress uh, associated with dealing with having to address um, uh, when something goes wrong with your order. Uh, and of course, those issues just scratch the surface of uh, considerations or potential risks online. Um, these findings uh, don't go into issues like data privacy uh, violations, uh, potentially misleading ads or representations of goods online, um, or cybersecurity risks. At the same time, um, as I mentioned, there is a huge opportunity here, huge global opportunity for um, also economic empowerment uh, of entrepreneurs and businesses around the world who can find um, new markets online. Uh, in fact, Poland, the host of uh, IGF uh, this year, uh, is such an example where um, uh, also um, the e-commerce has been growing as, as one of the fastest uh, countries in Europe. Um, and by 2025, it is projected to um, cover about 20% of the market. So one in four consumers 
uh, will be uh, shopping online. So that's a huge opportunity both for consumers uh, and for local businesses, um, but also um, a risk. So how do we move forward um, accounting for both? To help me answer this question today, I have with me a wonderful international panel, hybrid panel. Um, let me briefly introduce them. Uh, their detailed bios are on the website. Um, starting with uh, Przemysław Pauka, who also goes by Przemek, uh, assistant professor at the Future of Law Lab at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland. Uh, he is also um, an affiliated fellow at the Yale um, Law School uh, Information Society Project. Uh, then actually on site in Katowice, we have Paula Gavez, uh, advisor to the presidency of the Council of Ministers of Peru in charge of digital uh, regulation with special focus on digital economy, uh, cybersecurity and digital skills. Uh, Paula takes the award for traveling the farthest, I think, <laughs> on our panel. My travel involves uh, moving from one room to another in, in uh, my house. So Paula, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, making the trip. Uh, Paula is also a lecturer uh, at the University of Peru and uh, an open internet leader, which is a program that Skype um, manages together with uh, National Democratic Institute and Center for International Media um, Assistance. Uh, and last but not least, we have Pinkan Odrin, um, researcher from the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies, or CHIP, a leading Indonesian public policy uh, think tank uh, based in Jakarta. Uh, welcome to the panelists. Uh, welcome again uh, to the audience. And uh, let's our, get our conversation started. So um, first, I would like to focus on um, potential uh, issues or risks um, that uh, we see as um, the um, uh, consumers purchase more goods uh, and services online. Uh, and for uh, the initial comments, I will turn to Shemek. Uh, could you tell us more about your views or your observations on the common risks and problems uh, that consumers face uh, in the um, e-commerce sphere? Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for the voice, for the kind introduction, and thanks uh, for the whole Skype team for putting together this panel, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, indeed, in, in my opening remarks, I wanted to uh, think about the question, what precisely are the kinds of harms that consumers face in e-commerce and how these harms might uh, impact their trust in digital economy? And, or put in other words, if we are to respond somehow to this process of digitalization, either through legislation or through activities of private enterprise, uh, what should be the goals of this response? And as you said, even though internet you know, is amazing, it used to be seen as this democratic sphere for good, for liberation. Right now, the public opinion, the public narrative seem to be geared towards skepticism. Issues like fake news, privacy, cybersecurity, online manipulation, discrimination, etc., are, are uh, on a radar. And I think it's important that we manage to distinguish different types of potential harms that consumers face, as these different harms might call for different responses. And maybe the most interesting way to do it from the consumer policy perspective is to look at the types of harms that occur when something goes wrong, that is when technology malfunctions or where there is some fraudulent behavior by one of the parties to the transaction. Uh, and harms that occur even though everything went in accordance with a currently lawful business plan. And when it comes to the first type of harms, on one hand, we have the cyber security risks, as you mentioned. On the other, there's problems with particularly uh, fraudulent behavior. If somebody, for example, orders a product but does not receive it or receives something else, um, this is becoming more and more complicated as more direct transactions between consumers in one jurisdiction and sellers in another jurisdiction become widespread. And even though those are uh, large problems from the point of view of the consumers, policy-wise, I don't think they're that new. We're more or less used to dealing with them definitely in one jurisdiction. And when it comes to transnational activities, there are questions about whether 
legislation can help much, whether we should rather rely on, on, on private enterprise activities, but it's not something that has changed that much. Maybe the scale has changed, but the character of the problem has not. A much more nuanced uh, distinction can be seen when we look at the harms that can happen to consumers, even though everything works well. That is, the trader acts in accordance with its business plan and everything happens lawfully. And risks here can be almost entirely connected to pervasive data collection because also due to the pandemic, we now spend more and more time online. Uh, essentially every move we make online is being recorded in some type of data point. And then this data can be used for various uh, reasons, for targeted behavioral advertising, for designing services in a way that make them more engaging, that these people spend more time there, or can be used for uh, price discrimination or other types of discrimination, like for example, discrimination in uh, access to content. And the problem with this type of harms are that even though they might impact consumer lives to a large degree, the legislation as it stands now, not only does not prevent them, but also in a weird way, legitimizes these types of activities. For when it comes to personal advert uh, targeted advertising, for example, uh, if a consumer agrees to their data being collected and used for such a purpose, the only threshold that the company must meet is for the advertisement not to be misleading. However, with the ability to show us ads on our smartphones, essentially anytime, uh, everybody is vulnerable at one time or another, right? Like we might be tired, we might be sleepy, we might be particularly stressed. This type of feelings must, might come also from the way that uh, the service we're interacting with has been designed. Uh, and that is something that definitely needs, needs uh, to be addressed. Because even though for now it is lawful, it not only comes with monetary costs, if somebody pays more for something that is not in accordance with their preferences, but also with psychological costs, stress, as you mentioned, and, and, and that is something I think that, that we should be thinking about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Przemek. And let me turn it over to uh, Paula. Paula, I hope you can hear us well. Um, give us your perspective, how some of those risks uh, that uh, Przemek identified um, have been exacerbated uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and also just give us uh, your perspective coming from a different part of, of the world, uh, Latin America. Thank you, Anna. I hope you can hear me well in, in Zoom. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us here also in the room. Um, it is a pleasure to have this interesting uh, discussion with you. First of all, I want to cite former UNTAD Secretary General uh, Muki, Mukisa Kituyi, who once said that consumer protection is not only an economic best practice, but also a very vital for the success of, for digital revolution. Um, and I could not agree more. Trust is fundamental uh, to any human interaction, offline and online, and in this case, um, we need human to be safe online and to feel safe online. So it is um, our, sorry, I'm going to, it is our duty to foster this. Um, unfortunately, as you mentioned, Anna, during COVID, this mistrust has been exacerbated. Um, I am an open internet leader, as you mentioned, and during 2020, I did a, I conducted a research regarding the contact tracing efforts developed in Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay, in order to examine the digital implications of these apps across the region. In March last year, when the mandatory quarantine periods started, many people had no choice but to become consumer of this uh, contact tracing apps. And even though it was voluntary, in Latin America, there were record amounts of downloads. For example, in Peru, there are 40 million cell phones, of which 25 million have access to the internet. During the first 10 days after the Peruvian app was launched, the government registered 1 million downloads, which is huge for, uh, uh, for Peru. 
in the case of a recent launch. It is worth to highlight that according to my research, the privacy policies of these apps lack transparency regarding the implemented measures, security measures, excuse me, and they were very vague uh, and very confusing, difficult to understand by uh, any uh, internet user. Also, in some cases, the source code were not available for auditing. I know that the governments deploy these digital solutions in, in an emergency situation, but we need to bear in mind that this will not be the unique urgent uh, circumstances. And that is why when performing initiatives that process personal data, it must be done with due respect for privacy as a fundamental of a democracy. Likewise, uh, in my country, e-commerce transactions grew tremendously. Uh, for, for, in order for you to have a context, uh, we have a year over the year growth of 50%, an amount never reached before. And 70% of these online consumers were first time online buyers. This context exposed them to many risks because of lack of digital skills, um, dissatisfaction uh, when the process of the delivery, because also local entrepreneurs were not prepared to, to receive such huge amounts of orders. And also there were many scams and frauds. The, on the other hand, there were other troubles um, to, to build trust online. And I can, I can mention fake news, data breaches that are exposing personal information of billions of people around the world, and the lack of harmonization of regulation, at least in a region. In Latin America, we have many different regulations regarding consumer protection, and authorities lack um, authority for enforcement abroad. So, people do not feel comfortable when buying something from a, an e-commerce who is which is established abroad because if something goes wrong they do not have a plan that's why in the CEPAL, we were discussing among many policymakers how can we harmonize this and give consumers more channels to be uh, to be prepared and to and to have their digital rights respected, but also to foster the development of um, cross-border exports and cross-border e-commerce. Um, if you allow me, before finishing my my participation i would like to hear from the audience here on site and, and online what are your concerns so i'm going to share my screen so you can see the mentee code let me see in a second if i can do it and you can please write down what are your concerns regarding consumer protection and digital economy uh, i think i found you can, it's very easy. You can go to www.menti.com and use the code that you see in the screen, 32732947. The question is, what are your main concerns around digital economy from a consumer perspective? And it will appear in the screen once you are entering. It's just three words, uh, your main concerns. I know uh, Prashmeg and, and I, we have discussed some, but probably you have another ideas so we can have um, more ideas of what are your concerns. Let me, um, I hope that in the, in the Zoom are also seeing the screen and that you can go into menti.com and use the code that you're seeing. Let me repeat, uh, the code is 32732947. I can see now, for instance, data privacy, data breach, security. Yeah, that is the code, <laughs> thank you. Or also, please feel free here to, to tell, it, tell me uh, your, your concerns. I can see entrepreneurs trust, fake accounts, the work cloud is moving, untrustworthy sellers, reliable delivery. So yes, and I believe uh, many people are concerned regarding data breach and security because it is showing bigger now. 
But yes, this is our most common concerns regarding the digital economy. Thank you very much, Anna. As you can see, this is, these are the concerns of the audience and now we can keep the conversation flowing. Thank you, Paula. And uh, all right, uh, the screen sharing is stopped. Uh, all right, let's take um, another uh, geographic perspective and move to Asia. Uh, Finkan, take us um, to that space. What are some of the concerns, some of the risks, some of the issues and developments uh, you see in Indonesia or perhaps more broadly in the region when it comes um, to tr consumer trust in digital economy? Yeah, thank you so much, Anna, and also for all the participants that are joining online and also offline from Poland. Uh, nice to meet you here and good evening from Indonesia. So in recent years, uh, I have worked with the other teams in Center for Indonesian Policy Studies on the digital economy issues. And we witnessed how digitalization across all sectors are actually benefiting many Indonesians as well as the Asian uh, countries especially during the economic shock brought by the COVID-19 pandemic for the past two years that we can see. And digital economy itself, uh, we at CHIPS actually, uh, it falls under our community livelihood uh, research wing because we believe that digitalization actually can bring inclusive growth and it should be provided that it's supported with more enabling regulatory framework. As we also heard before from Freshmec and also Paula, that is really something that we need to have. And, and for the technology itself, it has made the sector easily accessible for many uh, people in the region as well as in Indonesia and allows more players in the digital economy to reach new markets. And that's uh, also impacting more uh, people become consumers of the digital products. And however, uh, we also see that the, this rapid um, advancements of the digital economy also comes with a certain new risk pertaining to users data uh, and also cybersecurity, which also seen in a region like Paula already mentioned before in Latin America, and it also appears in the Asian country as well. And it should be addressed through the regulatory framework, uh, but I would like to share more in particular in the area that is more prone to data privacy issues for many developing countries in Asia, and also in Indonesia itself, especially from the people's perspective as a consumer in the peer-to-peer, -peer, which is the peer-to-peer -peer lending or P2P lending, or specifically on the payday loan. So when people can uh, borrow money online and they can pay it back uh, uh, in the time of few days or few weeks. So it's, it's kind of a new uh, financial products that we can enjoy in many countries in Asia. And it also comes with and use a certain kind of risk for the consumer if they are not aware of that. So access to mobile phones and the internet actual, actually can help address the problems associated with the traditional financial services related to a bank account and also how to actually access the loan online for productive uh, uh, purposes or for more um, uh, daily day, uh, day, day to day uh, activities. And two thirds of unbanked Indonesians actually have access to a mobile phone at the moment, which means they can also, uh, they can uh, potentially also access the digital financial services, including the peer-to-peer -peer lending as a product and also other uh, financial technology. Uh, however, from our research in 2019, it illustrated that this innovation, this kind of innovation, actually lead to a greater um, financial inclusion for the unbanked population and brought more opportunity, but at the same time also comes with more risk, uh, especially with the situation of low education levels and then low awareness on the importance of uh, protecting personal data insufficient experience with the financial financial services, especially in the digital sphere, and also limited access to judicial or extrajudicial complaint mechanism, and especially um, targeting uh, more the low income one and also those living in the rural area. So 
we really see this kind of things becomes uh, the area where many people also uh, put more of like a bad uh, intention. So they are um, having a predatory lending practices and also we can see um, the practice of fraud as, uh, as well. So the predatory lending practices, uh, it also includes uh, the excessive interest rate and then aggressive debt collection practices and misuse of consumers' personal data. And I think uh, earlier, uh, Presmec also already mentioned about the, uh, the harmful effects that occurs on the uh, economy, digital economy. And this is also uh, appears not only in the e-commerce platforms, but also in the peer-to-peer -peer lending and financial services in the digital sphere as well. So the personal data privacy here has become one thing that needs to be discussed more uh, from the government perspective, as well as from the multi-stakeholders in order to find a way to regulate this uh, for more uh, protection to the consumer sites, because we see that more people are into the technology adoption and they use this um, digital lending for their daily basis. So it's really important to raise awareness uh, to the borrowers about their rights as a consumers and also about uh, how to actually uh, report any kind of uh, digital criminal things to the government. So I think that's can I, that what I can share from the perspective in Asia and also in Indonesia. Thank you so much, Pinkan and uh, the entire panel. We scoped a broad landscape of risks and potential issues uh, facing consumers uh, online. Uh, I want to turn now uh, a little more towards uh, solutions, perhaps, um, starting with something that uh, Pinkan already uh, cued us for, which is, um, let's talk a little bit more about the regulation of that space, uh, since for, for governments, that's a natural response, right? If there's a problem, governments default to, well, let's pass a law and try to make it better somehow. Uh, but that may or may not always be the case. Um, uh, so uh, I'll turn it, I'll take my, my moderator's privilege and, and, and turn uh, to the panel with another round of questions. But also I wanted to take uh, this moment and uh, remind um, our audience that they can also pose questions uh, online through the chat. And also I believe on site there's a raise hand uh, function. Uh, so we'll be sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A. So if you uh, have um, questions, uh, please do share and we'll, we'll get to them in turn. Uh, in the meantime, though, uh, let me turn back to Przemek. Um, when we think about, in particular, that data privacy regulation um, or other measures of consumer protection, uh, the European Union is one of the leading actors globally uh, shaping new norms or passing laws and regulations um, on that subject. Uh, give us your assessment of where uh, legal and regulatory landscape um, stands in Europe from the consumer uh, protection perspective. Thank you, Anna. Uh, indeed, in the EU, a lot has uh, recently been passed and even more is right now in the pipeline. Probably the most famous piece of legislation that, that, that most of you, I, I, I think, are familiar with is the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, which was passed in 2016, came into force in 2018. That was supposed to be a law that unified data protection laws further, uh, initially harmonized by the directive, with both the goal of having the same standard for every country within the EU, but also protecting the what is considered a fundamental right within the EU, that is uh, personal data protection. And this act is being promoted fiercely by Brussels online as the model of data protection, both through uh, legal requirements, if a European company wants to share data with a third country, that country uh, can meet uh, the requirements of the GDPR and, and the, the commission decision, but also through this rhetoric of, you know, this is a template, this is how we do it, and, and this is how you guys should be thinking about it. In the meantime, in the pipeline, there's, there's several other acts. There is a Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act supposed to regulate the platforms. There's Artificial Intelligence Act, which is supposed to put on a horizontal model on how to govern 
AI in general. And I think right now is the perfect time to sort of look at the efficacy of the GDPR approach as it is flagged and, and, and used in other, in other places. And I definitely, I, I want to make clear that what I'm saying here is not don't regulate the internet, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not anti-regulation. I'm not one of the people who, you know, think that market will take care of itself. But at the same time, I do think that if we pass bad regulation, and especially if we try to promote it as far as possible, it can also have very harmful effects. And GDPR is a perfect example of that, right? It's been in force for more than three years now. But when it comes to practices of giants like Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc., that is, fierce data collection and usage of this data to harm consumers, really not much has changed. What has changed is that huge costs have been uh, incurred by the businesses, both the giants and the smaller ones. Uh, Anti-competitive phenomena have occurred it, where only the big players that can sort of afford the compliance with the law can certify that you know everything is fine then if you're another business you'll be doing business with microsoft or or google and not and not uh, smaller emerging entities and at the same time all these companies that collect and use data now have tons of documentation that legitimizes these practices right now they can show look we've got all these documents explaining why what we're doing is lawful and i can see a very similar risk with this upcoming legislation in the AI regulation and in the Digital Services Act, where the way the commission seems to be acting is they imagine a perfect world, they describe this world in a piece of legislation, and then they put a huge fine on companies that do not live up to the standards they grow up there, even though these standards sometimes are hard to achieve, sometimes are not very important. Uh, and, and the problem that, that, that we can see in Europe is that, that policymakers create this good feeling about themselves that comes from having passed a law. And then they say, well, if there are still some problems prevailing, that is probably because we have an issue with enforcement. But very, very little is, uh, very little attention is devoted to the question, what precisely it is that we want to achieve through these acts and whether these acts are the best way to do it. So completely agreeing with what, what, what Paula has said about the need for you know, unified legal standards and what Ping Khan has said about uh, need for a re regulatory framework, I would just say a word of caution that is first, if other countries look at the EU, like remember that they also don't know what they're doing. And a word of caution to, to, to all of us to remember that simply because we pass a law that requires the world to be perfect, it does not yet mean that it's gonna become one. Um, very true, very true observation, um, Przemek. Um, Paola, let me turn to you as a fellow lawyer uh, from outside of the EU. Uh, obviously, uh, legislation such as GDPR has also had this demonstration effect around the world, uh, inspiring governments in other countries to pass similar laws with the same caveats that Przemek just mentioned, uh, where regulation may not necessarily be the answer. Uh, so from, from your perspective, for an emerging market like Peru, is regulation the answer? If so, what kind? If not, uh, what reservations would you have? Thank you, Anna. Well, the simple answer is no, in my opinion. Uh, the regulation is not the answer and is not the first option. Um, but we need to think it carefully. Um, first of all, uh, we need to see what is the regulation that is in place in our countries. Because uh, as you mentioned, I am a adjunct professor at the University of Lima. And when I do the e-commerce class, I, the first question I, I make is, is e-commerce regulated in Peru? And they all say, no, it isn't. And then I ask them, um, how about the Consumer Protection Code? Uh, do you see this article when it says uh, that it applies to any contract a, um, it can be electronic or, or physical. Oh yes, it applies, they said. So we need to understand that we don't need a regulation specifically for each uh, business model or for each technology that comes. Um, this is the first. Um, if non-law um, is applicable, then we need to think 
what is the best way to solve the public problem that we have? Because sometimes with initiatives, uh, we can solve the problem and we can help consumers. I am a firm believer that our consumers need to have the right to access adequate information to make informed decisions, um, mostly in this scenario that I just mentioned in Peru, for instance, more than 70% are first, uh, first timers in, in buying online. So they have a lot of doubts and they need to see clear, transparent, easy to understand terms and conditions. Um, but if we create a law and actually um, as a and as an advisor of the executive branch, I tend to have many conversations with the congressmen because with very good intentions, they present bills on, only with obligations and fines. But fines is not the solution because sometimes for entrepreneurs, uh, it's easy to pay the fine, but keep doing it the way they're doing it. So we need to motivate them um, to comply with these um, solutions that are better for consumers. So what we need is customer-centric uh, initiatives. And yesterday I was speaking with the, um, let me see the name because I, I it's a bit um, difficult, but the Polish um, Union of Entrepreneurs and Employers. And the, it happens the same here. Uh, they told me regulators would like to um, approve some laws, but first is it's important to speak with um, the ones that are in need, consumers, and then to speak with the private sector because they know how the market works. And just uh, to tell you an experience we're doing in Peru, we form committees and multi-stakeholder committees, um, and we sit there, academia, um, the technical um, the technical group as well, private sector and public sector. And then we discuss what is happening in the market. Uh, what do you think will be the solution? It's very difficult for us as moderators uh, from the agency of digital transformation to uh, balance different points of view and interest. But from there, from that discussions, we can make um, commitments and initiatives. We have seen that in e-commerce, the lack of digital skills is one of the main challenges because people buy, but they do not understand what are they doing, how they use their uh, credit cards or uh, digital wallets. And uh, we agreed that we will do a communication study that is better to approve a law with um, I don't know, fines and many obligations to the local entrepreneurs because it can jeopardize innovation. And we are aware that Peru is a developing country and we want uh, our local entrepreneurs to keep growing. So this is uh, my, my perspective, Anna. And, but I don't think it's only happening in Latin America for what I discussed yesterday. Um, some countries in Europe are, are suffering the same. So it's these spaces, this conference are so important because we can exchange views and think about best practices. And as Preshmek just mentioned, this will lead to a harmonization of, of norms or policies to, to bring a more, um, a, a space that consumers can trust. And this is our, our duty in the end. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. So I'm, I'm hearing two, two important insights. Um, one, um, that good intentions don't necessarily equal good results. Um, that applies in the legislative sphere, but I think, you know, more broadly in life, any, any sphere of life, but particularly when it comes to legislation and regulation. Um, and another trend of concern is uh, just passing the law uh, top down, um, maybe inspired by another country, maybe without uh, sufficient uh, effort to translate um, uh, local law to match local realities and uh, just relying on copying and, and pasting, uh, and also passing the laws without sufficient consultation with um, the people that are affected by it, uh, including local businesses. Um, well, let's let's continue that thread. Um, uh, Pinkan, tell us about your experience in Indonesia, and and specifically, I know there are some interesting efforts you are uh, working on uh, that could maybe uh, be uh, an example of how 
to make um, regulation a little more inclusive, a little more participatory, and a little closer to uh, the subjects who are being regulated. Yeah, so what happened in Indonesia is actually also similar what uh, Paula already shared in Peru related to the regulation itself. So the government cannot act alone to achieve this balance actually uh, between the right amount of safeguards they are uh, uh, looking for and also the right amount of facilitation on fo uh, fostering the digital economy as well as to protect the consumer rights at the same time. So the traditional policy making process are unequipped to keep up with this kind of dynamic um, sector of digital economy that is with the speed of um, innovation or to address the information asymmetry in practice. So the state-centered uh, digital governance has resulted in more legal uncertainty and could come with the overburden for the private sectors, which also become the counterpart for the governments in fostering the digital economy sectors. So for example, in Indonesia, we also face several kind of issues like unclear local content stipulations and then restrictive content moderation for the user-generated content platforms, including for the e-commerce platforms, and then a fake um, and costly data management obligation for the private sectors. And therefore, more accommodative approach is really needed here. And there's come up with a approach called the co-regulation that should be considered for governments uh, in Indonesia specifically. And also we believe that this concept also could be uh, more streamlined in other countries in regulating their uh, digital economy. So we are in, at CHIPS uh, for the couple of years actually having a research and also advocacy on this issue. And we're also grateful for the amount of support coming from SAIP as one of our partners in doing so. So actually we implemented one of the guidelines uh, that already published by SAIP and fostering this uh, kind of um, multi-stakeholder approach in regulating digital economy and enabling for more inclusivity in the digital economy. So maybe you wonder about what is co-regulation approach. So the co-regulation approach itself allows sharing responsibilities between actors uh, with, uh, be it the government and also the private sectors and civil society in tackling several challenges brought by the rapid uh, transformation of digitalization like issues that already mentioned uh, data governance and then digital divide within or um, between countries and then uneven digital literacy skills and the inequality of access to uh, the use of technology. So it actually goes beyond regulators simply getting their inputs from uh, other uh, non-government uh, non stakeholders, but also to consider the shared responsibilities in the implementation process. So it's not, it doesn't stop in the policy making process, but to give uh, more responsibilities uh, in conducting those um, policies in practice. And then of course we still need uh, under the eye of regulators in, in implementing this core regulation approach. But the idea actually to serve that uh, the business also would be a better position to understand the market, as well as with the rapid development of the digital products that come in. Uh, so they will have also known what, uh, what things to be enhanced so to protect the, their consumers, uh, be it from the uh, digital products like the e-commerce platforms or the peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. So uh, this kind of thing is really important to be heard. And uh, we uh, in CHIPS at Indonesia also talk to um, our government uh, in the ministerial level, and they are actually open to this uh, new approach. It's actually not really new, but it's a new term perhaps because more and more uh, people in the government of Indonesia usually only knows about the self-regulation, which is uh, more uh, centralized in the private sector as the sole actors. But with this core regulation approach, we would like to bring collaborative action between multi-stakeholders, between the government and also private sectors and civil society. So one of the example uh, in Indonesia uh, is the regulatory sandbox implementation for the financial technology services. 
uh, it, it was proven uh, successful in stimulating the innovation that results in more inclusive financial services. And from uh, other countries, uh, the neighboring countries of Indonesia, Singapore, this kind of um, uh, regulatory sandbox actually uh, occur in the personal data protection area. So they are uh, working on uh, several regulations on the personal data protection using this uh, regulatory uh, sandbox approach. So it's one thing that uh, perhaps could be considered for uh, countries in other region as well in dealing with the rapid changes of digitalization. Thank you, Vikan. And um, definitely, uh, I think around the globe, we've seen other examples also of regulatory sandboxes as a useful approach where you sort of give a space uh, for private sector to innovate. And then based on that experience, shape how the laws should apply more broadly. Uh, you also highlighted an important aspect of uh, perhaps trying to match um, the, the softer uh, version of governance, so self-regulation by business with the harder uh, regulation by government in, in this the process of co-regulation. Um, and just to uh, give a note of explanation, uh, I posted in the chat for uh, our audience uh, links to the site resource that you mentioned. Um, a while ago, we published um, a digital economy enabling environment guide uh, with the audience in mind being um, primarily private sector, so business associations, chambers of commerce in emerging markets, uh, where both new laws and regulations on issues like data privacy, consumer protection, uh, cybersecurity uh, are being passed. And yet the private sector beyond tech companies may not have very good um, understanding of the issues or ways to engage with the government. So our thoughts uh, behind creating those issues that research was to give the private sector an additional uh, tool. What we found interesting since then is that uh, actually many policymakers have also been interested in this guide, which highlights probably another issue we haven't explored quite in depth, which is often government regulators also do not have a uh, full understanding of, of the issues or, or the implications. So uh, there's uh, education that needs to happen on both sides. Um, all right, and uh, before we move on to Q&A, let me also post a link to uh, something else that we mentioned uh, in conversation with Paula, which is the um, Open Internet for Democracy uh, initiative. Um, Paula uh, is one of our uh, wonderful alums. Uh, it's an annual um, non-residential uh, leadership program some of the other open internet leaders also participate in this IGF. So if you look at the website and see their bios, some names and faces may, may look familiar from other panels. Um, with that, uh, let's turn to the Q&A and looks like we have a raised hand on site. So let's see if we can connect there. Hi, uh, my name is Martina Dershniak Noajo, and I'm from the Office of Consumer Protection in Poland. So it's very interesting to listen to this. And we also have a panel tomorrow on sustainable consumption in e-commerce. So, so uh, I'm happy to hear this and to listen to everything. So um, my office is, uh, is an enforcer of consumer law. So it's interesting to hear that uh, that uh, discussion here and also to, to, to listen a little bit what you think about, about the regulations and about law. Uh, we also participate, of course, in the policy making of uh, consumer protection laws. Um, for me, it's interesting to hear, and, and one of the panelists already answered uh, partly uh, to this question, um, because of course I agree that that part of the of the. Um, I, I mean, from from our perspective, uh, enforcement of con consumer law is is is, uh, is essential, and and and. Personally, I think that it's it's a tool. Regulation is a tool that is uh, guaranteeing uh, compliance because it's it's the, the strictest kind of uh, tool that you can have for for um, ensuring uh, some kind of level on, of consumer protection because it, it it imposes some some obligations and and they have to and they can be enforced by by an authority. Uh, but I also agree that uh, there is other kinds of actions uh, that are necessary and that can help. Um, 
and these are perhaps things like so, soft soft actions and and cooperation and uh, cooperation uh, with different actors and and different uh, um, organizations. Uh, so I was I was interested to hear a little bit uh, on that because um, while I agree that this is this is very important also from the participative point of view. I mean it enables also different perspectives and it helps also regulators to see a little bit more the the problems. Uh, 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 in the field, uh, it's also making some kind of change. But for me, it's interesting to hear how can we make sure that this kind of soft actions and cooperation um, uh, among different actors will also be effective. Thanks. Was, uh, is, for, is your question to uh, a specific panelist or should we open it up to? Uh, no, it's, it's just if anybody wants to, wants to answer, but that's just my, my uh, reflection. All right. Uh, well, I would say since the question came from Poland, Przemek, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you first and then we'll see if anyone else wants to chime in. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, look, from the enforcer's point of view, of course, it seems like regulation is the thing that you want to have, right? Because then there is the, the, there is a particular norm, particular provision that you can focus on enforcing. And if somebody crosses it, then you can initiate proceedings. And, and it seems like something's happening. But when it comes to consumer protection itself, if, if you look at the types of problems that we currently see in a digital economy, say with targeted advertising, imagine a situation in which I wake up in the morning, I'm tired, I had a rough night for whatever reason. The platform that shows me ads, say Facebook or Google knows about it because they're tracking the time I usually sleep. They have the ability to influence the way I feel about the world through the content they show me, right? So Facebook shows me some sad or outrageous news in the morning, I feel bad about it. And then there is this product advertised to me, which based on the data analysis of my own data on everybody else's data, uh, is judged by the ad delivery system as much more likely for me to purchase in this particular moment. Now, this particular purchase might run against my long or medium term preferences. In short, I don't need that product. I don't want that product. But in that particular moment, I feel like, you know, buying it will soothe my emotional distress in which I find myself in. Now, is this unlawful under Polish or European consumer law? Not really, right? The ad is not deceptive. The ad is not misinformative. It's not misleading. It might be judged as an aggressive practice, but we all know how hard it is to meet that threshold. And so under the law, as it is, everything is fine, even though there is this particular harm that besets a consumer. And so this is on, on, on the point that law is, is you know, Regulation is necessary to ensure compliance. Sure, with, within the system that already exists, but there might be several problems that fall, fall out of it. So I don't think anyone here is saying, well, do less regulation, do less enforcement. The, 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 the sentiment strikes me as, let's be much more mindful when designing the law and let's be much more, let, let, let's have a shared responsibility in its enforcement, right? It's not just for the Bureau of Consumer Protection in Poland to look at such practices. It's also for the competitors to look at such practices, right? If there is a consensus within a community that this type of practice should not be allowed, there might be certain companies that are better equipped through their technology experience, knowledge of the market to detect this type of activities and maybe warn the enforcer, maybe warn the public. I, I, I think that, 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 that is just the, the, the sentiment we were trying to, to uh, flag here. Thank you for the question, though. Thank you. And Pinkan, is there anything to add on, on that front from your experience of best, best practices in um, engaging um, uh, the local stakeholders in developing the law, as we said, but also the extent to which you think uh, enforcement is also a shared uh, duty? Yeah, so uh, the enforcement itself already become one challenge in Indonesia because for the digital economy uh, sector, actually there are around 14 uh, government institutions or ministries that are in charge for this. So there are a lot of uh, regulations from the law uh, until the ministerial level 
regulations that are comes around 60 uh, regulations at the moment and some of them also overlap into each other so uh, with this kind of regulations we need to do more a uh, dialogue on what regulation that actually need to be amended and what regulations are actually or are no longer uh, working to protect the consumers and also to foster the digital economy um, sectors in Indonesia. So when we talk with more government institutions, we're also trying to emphasize this kind of uh, thinking. So they would like to uh, reconsider what they are planning because most of the time they are thinking that uh, by having more regulations in place, it actually uh, great for um, the implementation process. But at the current state in Indonesia with the large number of regulations in place, actually the implementation is not really well. So we can see there's like more a counterproductive um, reality uh, compared to what they are trying to have with uh, bringing more regulation in place. And yeah, I've also shared the same concern with Presnek before about this. And I believe that it's not only about the regional perspective, but uh, perhaps more global perspectives on the regulatory framework as well. Great, thank you, Pinkan. Do we have any other yes. questions from the audience? Or Paula, uh, did you wanna uh, also comment? There is a question, Anna. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much for interesting uh, discussion. My name is Anna. I'm from uh, Moscow University. And uh, I completely agree that uh, all e-commerce platform collects our uh, personal data, uh, information about our um, preferences, because we click agree button when we, uh, uh, when we, uh, uh, move to the platform and when we uh, sign the user agreement. So it's uh, the circumstance of user agreement um, and uh, uh, no one, uh, nobody can define the so these um, terms, only e-commerce platforms. And maybe you know some examples when uh, states or maybe uh, some uh, organizations of uh, uh, self-regulation uh, define the demands to e-commerce platforms about terms of user agreements. For example, uh, if uh, can I uh, refuse to uh, give all my personal data and to continue using the platform? Of course, no. Uh, it's um, uh, a special type of contract when I join to the terms uh, in whole and I can change any circumstance any terms of this agreement how is it possible to regulate it and if you know examples i will be grateful for them thank you paula would you like to take uh, this question um i'm turning to lawyers on the, the panel first <laughs> Sure. Um, very quick, because I can see that we only have one minute and maybe we can uh, keep going with the conversation in the side here. But yes, this is a huge challenge because companies are, are not understanding yet that people need to understand what is accepting. And that's why we need to start working in a more uh, design thinking way. And regulators and lawyers need to start uh, writing in a more um, simple way, or first um, to put the the basic information in the beginning, and yes, make it mandatory that people should open and scroll down and read. And if we do it in a graphic way, in a Q and A uh, way, that's and that is uh, we also as, as lecturers, as professors should be um, teaching at school. This is what we're doing at University of Lima, actually. So. Um, probably um, a way of doing this roundtable, a uh, multi-stakeholder roundtables meeting that I, that I mentioned uh, is good, but yes, if this does not change, um, this is something that uh, regulators can, can be tackling because um, it's important. I mean, people are probably accepting um, to give or, or their life or their information to their company. So yeah, we need to start looking at this. I'm sorry, I rushed, but I, I just see the, <laughs> the clock. 
Thank you, Paula. And yes, uh, there are some tools that help to translate the legalese to something more um, understandable to the consumer. So I think there are tools where you can uh, look at the user agreement and it may maybe highlight the, the key uh, sections of it. Um, Premek, do you have any other thoughts on that um, um, in our last minute or so of the panel? I, I would just add that on, on top of making it easier for consumers to understand what they agree to, as, as was rightly pointed in the question, sometimes there is no real choice, right? Like I don't really have a choice whether I use Zoom or Google or Facebook uh, because I, I, I have to, right? I'm, I'm forced to do so by my life circumstances. So on top of making it easier for people to know that there are various ways in which the law tries to remove that choice from the particular transaction. So within the EU, we, for example, have the unfair terms legislation that certain terms just cannot be put in the contract. GDPR has it about the uh, personal data collection part of the contract. Uh, but I think instead of doing what the EU is trying to do now, which is just pass one act that will solve all the problems with the platforms, we should just much more, in a much more tailored way, look at the particular harmful types of activities that platforms engaged in when it comes to data and just regulate them one by one. I know that lawyers, especially in Europe, don't like it. They, they, they just like one short law that is supposed to solve everything. But maybe, you know, certain ways in which data is collected is not harmful, right? Like not all personalization of advertisements uh, is bad. So just focus on the, on, on the psychological harms, focus on the abuse of vulnerability parts and, and respond maybe within consumer law, not necessarily within data protection law would be my one minute answer. Thank you. And given that we're out of time, I'll give the final word to Pinkan. Any final words on or thoughts on um, educating consumers or helping uh, them better understand their, their rights uh, online? Yeah, so for the consumer itself re regarding their own rights in the digital spheres, especially in uh, using the digital products, it's really important to uh, actually aware of what you are using in daily basis and what are you uh, obliged to do within that uh, services. So when we already know about that, we become more aware on in terms of the risk that may come in. So it's really important to actually be mindful about the products that we are using in and also to put uh, pers our personal data protection uh, itself in our top of mind uh, by creating passwords manager and also uh, put that in place. So more in terms of this uh, self um, approach to protect about this, and we can also talk with our family and friends regarding this issue. So educating um, uh, consumers can be started with our own um, circles. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Thank you so much. With that, we are officially out of time. Uh, many thanks again to the panel. Thank you very much uh, to the audience, both uh, on site in Katowice and online. And we get, hope to continue this conversation offline and online. So do stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Thank you.